Welcome, so let me go to slide present of you. So um, we're gonna talk about Agile International Coaching Meetup. Is that what we came to talk about? No? I don't think so, Godwin. Oh, okay. Okay. I think this is one of your I think this is one of your tricks. <laughs> okay. So um thank you so much for um Nelu oversold this. I'm not that great. I'm just trying to be like all my mentors that I sit at here. So I'm just trying to be like one of you. But at the same time, I, I'm happy, thrilled to be here. And um, I wish I'll be able to add value at the end of the day. And if I suck, just tell me. And so that way we can do better next time. So, um, <clears throat> so Nelu, we're going to do this, right? Um, go yeah. to the episode. Yeah. So, so absolutely. So let me go ahead and share with you a link. Okay. Yes. This and an information for you guys to join our pulled everywhere. All right, it's ready to go. You can do it uh, on the link I sent to you uh, on the chat, or you can also do it via text. So let, let's know when you send stuff so that we can see what it does. If you're interested. Um, so what I'm gonna, okay. So the question yes. is, do you know what CT stands for? So. Great. Great. Okay. Looks like at least we have someone. <laughs> Crazy team cheerleader. I think this that's great. Cheerleaders. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mercy, I don't know this, the right answer. This, we already have that. Let's have the second one. Awesome. Yeah, so that we can just move on. So, so uh, go, go ahead. ahead, Nelly. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so which audio organization are you most familiar with? Wow. AICI is pulling 40%. We're doing it. Ooh. Ooh, ooh. I think I'm going to open up some more computers so I can do more voting. So that you can have more votes. <laughs> <laughs> but this is good, though. It's really good. So, so let's, let's have the third one. All right, so let me present. Okay, so this is number three. Can you see it now? Yes. All right, so what percentage of your time are we spending on learning new things outside my job? This one is just for us to train in, okay? Much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 50. 60. Okay, 50, 40%. So, um, this is just for us to actually understand um, the power what learning does to us because sometimes in in our busy times we we sometimes feel like we're so busy that we cannot really learn and we only stop learning the day we die. So some of us um, for some of us who drive to work, we could actually listen to podcasts while we're driving. But if you're like me that only listen to music, then you'll be in trouble. You won't learn much. And so, yeah, just uh, we just put that in just to see 
what percentage of us, what else do we do apart from work? Um, thank you, Nelly. All right. So thank you for replying to all of our polls. I think we had a good answer. Yeah. So the other two, um, somebody already said what CTC stands for. And, um, and the other one was for us to understand why um, the CTC journey, why we're here. So. I think I didn't share well. Let me stop sharing. Yeah, we, yeah, there we go. There we go. Okay. Okay. So today, um, I'm practically just going to talk to you about um, what it meant for me when I started this journey, where this journey had led me to and what it is that I felt I was actually lacking before I started this journey. And what is it in for me, apart from some of the issues come emanating from this journey, what is it that I'm taking more importantly in this journey? So if you look through the agenda, I don't wanna just go through right through. So where am I now? Why did I decide to start it? And what was it that I was lacking? So um, I will start by, actually showing this is my family and anybody who knows me you could see that I'm surrounded by ladies and I'm the only one that is a guy in the house so decisions I cannot really make decisions because I get outvoted all the time and so um, on the right is my family my wife and on the left I wanted to put this other picture down here with this one here so, but let me go up to this one. Um, on the left is my wife, Jasmine, most of you, I know her. And um, I think if I have to talk about her and what I'm saying today, then it wouldn't really make much meaning because um, she had added more meaning to what I'm doing today and who I am today than I would have been before meeting her. And so it kind of funny that I'm surrounded by women. And when I come to the next slide, I would also tell you that my agile journey wouldn't have been what it is without these two ladies here, I knew on the right and Kemi on the left. So when I say I'm surrounded by women, it makes sense. Um, one person is missing and two people are missing in this picture. I couldn't find their picture. Um, one of two of them as one of them is here and I'm looking at him. If you know how you crave for Santa, then you know who I'm talking about. You know, when you when you're a child and your mom said Santa may not visit you because you have been naughty. So you know what I'm talking about. So one of them is sitting here, and these are the people that had added meaning to what agility is to me. So Rick is there, Coach Act is there, so many other people. But I showcase this just to let you know, understand what it means to come from where you were before to where you never were, was now. So, and um, I've volunteered a whole lot, but sometimes when you volunteer and you get thank you, it means a lot to you. But then I got this book from Jeff Patton about a month, a few weeks ago at Agile 23. And even though I've gotten a lot of thank yous, but this one meant so much because he, he signed it and he gave it to me with love. He didn't give it to me because let me just give him so that he won't bother me. So if you're out there and you feel like there's really nothing you get in volunteering, you might have to have a rethink because it doesn't matter where you're volunteering, even if you're volunteering the food bank, there's value in it. So my journey started very fun. My agile journey didn't start until I started selling cars. So I sold very fast cars. And as I was talking to Nelu and Regina yesterday, I realized that my need for speed 
was actually what made me, brought me out here. You know, so I, I never knew anything about cars, never. I love cars, but I never knew anything, not to talk about high-end cars. So I met a little boy and the dad and something in between happened. And I started asking him questions and he pointed me to the direction of agility. And that was how I left car sales to be a scrum master. So if you look at where this is starting, I've had education before, but the part of education that leads you to agility is always different. And so I get from education to getting expenses, experiences and to where I am now and where I'm going. So if you look at this here, it's just the story of every one of us here. It's just where you put yourself in those lines that actually matters. Like the poll I asked it a little while, like how much of your time do you spend on education or, or doing something outside your work? You might be doing a PhD. You might be doing your master's. At the same time, someone might just be doing a certification. It's all education. It all leads you to that promised land where you want to go. And so starting from where I am as a car salesman to where I am today, it might be a quantum leap for me because thinking about it, sales is a lot different. But at the same time, there was there's a whole lot of agility in car sales because you do a follow-up. We do stand-ups every day and you have to do a follow-up every day. And there's also repeat customers, which are lessons learned. So if you give somebody a very bad experience, they're not going to come back to you. So also, if, you're, if you suck as a scrum master, your team will derail. And so all of them kind of interwent together. But I wouldn't have been who I am today if I hadn't really started selling cars because it kind of opened up a new variety to me because the car sales is actually where you don't judge a book by the cover. And so the same way you don't judge people just by meeting them, seeing who they are just because they think. So we move, where am I now and where do I wish to be? So when this journey started for me, it was more of, okay, let me do agile coaching. Let me work, become an agile coach or become a program manager or this. And, but I, I finally realized that I have to practice coaching than just talking to Scrum Masters or talking to my team. I also realized that not just being a coach, I also have to specialize. And after that, I have the high hope, okay, maybe I will go to leadership roles, maybe CSC, whatever. But at the end of the day, if I sit down in where I was 10, 12 years ago and say, I'm happy being a scrum master, then I wouldn't be talking to you today because I wouldn't have that hunger that propelled me to start getting to this journey. Even at the starting of this journey, um, I started it, I stopped, I started it again and I stopped and I woke up one day and said, okay, I have to restart it again. But at the same time, the fact that I wanted to get to that leadership role propelled me to shun all the other noises coming around me and saying, you cannot do it. All those little ones that talk to you when you want to wake up at five o'clock and say, no, you can sleep till eight and do this later. So those little white noises in my ear, the role, those where I wish to be actually propelled me to make me say, okay, if A, B, C, D can do it, I can also do it. And so that is where, that is the part that I want you to understand. The difference between when you just think that things will be handed over to you. You know, um, I have a trend that I wanted to do called coaching and resilience in other places and where we think about, oh, I am a lady, I'm a guy, I'm black, I'm white. They're not gonna, I'm not too good enough. They're not gonna hire me because I have just two years of experience. They're not gonna do this. All those things are nothing but noise in your ears. Because if you listen to them, the power of the thing, if you listen to them and say, okay, because I have two years experience and the other guy has five, so I shouldn't apply for that job. 
it doesn't mean because the person you are talking to, there might be something that you propel in them that will make them actually see value in you than the person that has 10 years experience. And so I saw those things as a way of keeping me abreast of what's happening. And so I shunned all the noises and I kept going. It now leads me to this next one. Um, why did I decide to begin the city's journey? After I had stopped for a while and uh, Kemi uh, called me one day and we we're talking. And if you know Kemi, you would understand one thing. She's British Nigerian. <laughs> and so she has, sometimes she doesn't have filters and she just tells it to you direct. She, we we're saying something and she just said, my friend, what are you even doing about your CTC? And I'm like, um, this is like, there's no MM. I'm going to start it again and I'm going to, and we must have to do it this year. And I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and so, and so it, it, it kind of propelled me and it now gave me those things that I know that I'm actually able to do before. So I have a passion for helping people. I've had this passion since I was in, I was a little baby. And I have a passion because I, my wife tells me that I can talk to a three if a three can talk back to me. So I, I am that person that I can talk to you as well as you can respond. And I, if I get to a new place, I might be challenging, I might be quiet, but I pick up easily to talk to people. So my passion for helping teams kind of prepared me to say, okay, if I can do this as a scrum master, I can also do it as a coach. And if I can do it as a coach, it also means I can do it on a higher level. And so that part of sitting teams struggling, I needed something that will propel me, that will make me feel that I'm okay, I can do this. And so that was that passion to say, I can start this journey and I can finish it up. So, and you also see that there are people that are drawn to coaching, not just because they want to advance their career. There are people that are psychologically fit to just talk to people and suit them. You know, they may not be a therapist. They may just be the people who find it easy to talk to people when they have problems. And so I find out that I'm drawn to people. And so because I'm drawn to people, I tend to be the one that listens to what they're going through. They have a fight with their girlfriend. Tony, what do you think? Are you married? Do you have kids? What do you think I should do? I'm like, sometimes like, I'm not a marriage counselor, but I don't think you should do that to your girlfriend, you know? Or I don't think you should say that to your wife, you know? So stuff like that um, kind of made me, I said, okay. And also at the backdrop of it is, okay, I also want to advance. I also want to be that one person that, I also want to make more money than I'm making today. And so I said, okay, if I do that, I could also have a career advancement. And then there's this urge of personal development. There's this urge of wanting to be able to sit down in a crowd and be able to understand what they're saying and able to contribute to that. And also helping your team at the end of the day. And if you have interest in human and psychological behavior, you would understand that there are other things. Yeah, I asked this question. Who actually told us that when you have a baby and it's a boy, who started that, that the boy should wear blue and girls should wear pink? When did it start? It's psychology of human behavior. We felt like ladies would prefer stuff that is flowery, beautiful, and guys are more macho and that. And so it took me a while to understand that if you can read behaviors, if you can see how people react to when you come into the room, if you can read cues, if you can sit down and talk to people without even minding who they are, where they're from. So you could also help people. And so in that desire to make an impact and that desire to help, that kind of also propelled all this and said, okay, I should actually do something that I love. And in doing it, I should have something that can put a stop to it. And so that's why one of those reasons why I said, okay, 
if the CTC can help me get this, I should be able to do it. So it now leads me to the next one. Oh, let me go back. Yeah. So what was it that I was lacking? You know, um, I remember um, I was given a team and, um, and the director then that was in charge of the team, he always comes to the daily stand-up. And so one day, I, every time he comes in and they're saying stuff, he jibes in and he talks. And he's not just a director. There's, there are differences when you have a director in certain banks and a director in other banks. And they are, the levels are quite high and he's direct, he's like a senior director. So one day I put him aside and said, I'm gonna stop, take you off the list to come to the standup. And he said, well, I started trying to explain to him. And he said, you're just a bloody scrum master. You don't have the right to do that. And, and I, if, it, I felt bad and I said, yeah, I understand, but it's also my, duty to protect the team. And he said, what are you protecting them from? I said, I'm protecting them from the sharks. He said, are you calling me a shark? I said, no, I didn't say that. I just said, it's, it's my right <laughs> to protect the team. So, so he said, okay, I hear you. The next day he came to, to the meeting and he said, um, due to ABCD, Scrum master saying that I shouldn't be. So this is going to be my last day coming to the standup. So he did not recognize my what because I was a scrum master. He saw me as the lowest of the herbs to give direction or to tell him what to do. And so because I'm just a scrum master to him, if I were an agile coach, then he would have accepted what I said, even if it was wrong. But because I'm a scrum master, this was how this came to me. And so I felt like, okay, if I'm lacking this now, even if what I'm, everything that I'm doing, so I should try something, get me some little things to add to what I have now. So that at least when I talk, even though somebody knows I know what I'm talking about, they might be able to at least recognize what I'm saying as something that is good for the team. And so I also find out that there are some skills that you have as a scrum master that you need more if you're a coach. What am I saying? What I'm saying is that there are some things as a scrum master that you might be, might be doing. When somebody tells you you're wrong, you feel funny, but if but at the same time, if you're doing it as a coach, you might be doing the same right thing together. Same thing the coach is doing, the scrum master is doing it. You find out that people will take that authority more. And it also boosts your confidence that, okay, I'm doing this now, not just because I'm a scrum master, I'm doing it now. And people are giving me accolades than they would have given me if I was a coach. So this is what is going on in my head. It's not that it was right or it was wrong, but what was going on in my head that I actually need that confidence. I need that credibility. And how can I get them? So I went back and started doing a whole lot. I, I started going to meetups. I started reading more. I started doing certifications. I just wanted to broaden my knowledge, broaden my horizon so that when someone is talking to me, I could tell them that, yeah, I might not be a scrum master today, but I've also taken ABCD that will help me to be a coach. And so it wasn't just because of what he said, but to me, I felt I was lacking that credibility. I felt I didn't have much knowledge in what the difference between coaching and being a scrum master, even though we all know that scrum masters coach as well. But in a different sphere and in a different environment. And so I felt like the only way I could actually get to where I want to be was for me to learn more. And so I now started thinking, 
I now said, okay, I think I have to do this with passion or nothing at all. I have to put my mind in it. I have to discover my passion for coaching. And so with my genuine interest in helping others, I felt like the other thing that I can use, it's my natural ability to empathize with people. It's that ability to talk to people. So you get into, have you ever sat, I, how many of you here would want to sit with a baby in an airplane? That is not yours. Just a mute and say yes. If you can, if you're happy, say you're getting to your seat and you discover that the, ba- the person sitting beside you is a, ba- a lady with a baby and another baby. <laughs> All of us will run away. So I was going to tell us one time, um, two stories that I'm gonna tell you. One, I was going, I posted one on LinkedIn. I was going to Dallas one time and I sat beside this mom and the baby and the baby was cranky, like, and I should wait and she was crying. Everybody was uncomfortable. So people started, you know, giving those signs you could see. People started looking up back and forth. So she couldn't know what to do. So I said, can I hold her? So she she looks at me, I don't know if I can let you hold my baby, you know? So I said, let me try. So she said, at one one stage, she got tired and she said, sure. So I held the baby and I started playing with the baby. And within eight, five, eight minutes, the baby went to sleep. And she slept with my arm. And so she said, oh, she sleep. Thank you. Okay, can I have her back? Immediately I tried to give her back to the mom. She started crying again. So I held that baby from, I think I was, I was in Columbus then to Dallas until we got off the plane. So I know that sometimes being empathetic is not just something we do out of the cup. But if you show those signs all the time, then you realize that there is something inordinate in you that you could actually give up. Re- Regina has her hands up, uh, Garwin. Oh, who is that? Oh, Regina, yeah. So, are you the baby whisperer? Is that what we're going to oh. call you now, the baby whisperer? I, I, my wife actually calls me that. <laughs> True story. Because we could go to visit people or people who come to visit us and she'll try to cry carry the baby and the baby will refuse everybody. But if I carry the baby, they will come. I don't know what it is, but I'm, it's the gospel. They will come to me awesome. five out of six times. <laughs> yeah. So the second story about having empathy is I was, I was traveling out of Charlotte. I had three hours to spare and I didn't really know why I went so early to the airport. So and I said, okay, let me just go grab something to eat before I, like, I saw so many restaurants that were two, three people on the line. I went to this one that had like six people there. So I'm like, okay, for so many people to be here, the food must be good. So I stayed up line and I got seated. So I'm sitting right beside this young lady, young girl. And then there's another lady with her laptop sitting opposite her. So we sat down and I saw that every time I turn, I'm seeing her sniffing. I heard her sniff, but when I turn, she bent down so that I wouldn't see her. So I felt like maybe she had a cold or something. So I was waiting, they got me a drink. When the waiter came around and asked her something, she raised her head. I saw that her eyes were really bloodshot red. So I let the waiter waiter go. So after like, 10 seconds, I said, I asked her, are you okay? She bent down and looked at me and she just said, yes. So, okay. So I kept, my food came and the waiter came to her and asked her if she wanted something else. She said, no, the waiter turned around. So I took the opportunity to say, I don't think you're okay. Something is wrong. Can you, can you share? Are you all right? And um, she raised her head up. Soon as she raised her head up, flood of tears came down. So I stood from where I was sitting and I went close to her. So this time, <laughs> I'm a black man, I recognize that. And she's a little white girl. So <laughs> I went close to her and I said, 
what is it? Are you okay? Is there anything I can do? Um, blah, blah. And this is to what you know, um, Regina. So I said, can I give you a hug? <laughs> Regina said, I'm a hugger. <laughs> so, so I said, can I give you a hug? And she said, yes. So I hugged her and she held me so tight. I was scared because people were now looking at us. <laughs> so, so after a while, the lady sitting now noticed what was going on. She now came just to know what was going on. So she raised her head and, and I said, what is going on? She now said, She's going to San, going to school, and this is the first time she's leaving her mom. And this was during COVID. And she said her younger brother and dad died of COVID. And so, and this is the first time she'll be leaving. And so she's worried what her mom will be feeling now and how her mom is going to take her leaving home. So at this point, everybody in the restaurant gathered around her, and everybody started giving her a hug. So after all this was done, the lady sitting beside me now said, I've been sitting with her in the last 45 minutes or one hour. I didn't notice anything. How did you notice what was going on with her? So I said, I look at cues. When I come to a place, I don't just sit down. I look around just to looking for cues and all that. And she said, what do you do? So I told her, she said, I think I'll leave the job I'm doing and start doing what you're doing because if what you're doing made you notice what she's doing, then it's something very good. So why am I saying this? I'm saying this that if you have that natural ability to empathize with people, if you have that natural ability to help people, then you discover that passion for coaching that you might not know you actually have. And then you also enjoy doing it. And in that way, you can also see potential in others that you could either help or take from them. And the personal growth about it is what we all are looking for. But at the end of the day, you need that passion. You need that empathy. You need all that together, not just getting the certificate, not just being a coach. There are coaches that you talk to and you'd be like, okay, I shouldn't have spoken to you because right now my problem has doubled. So, <laughs> so you have to be able to empathize and also show the difference between when the person came to meet you and where they are, not by solving their problem, but by at least leading them to somewhere where their problem would be solved. So, and then, I come to this part of setting a goal. If you all remember early this year, I think the wise, the better one knows this, that Scrum Alliance decided that CTCs and CECs would not be given certification anymore after the end of this year. So that actually put like everybody, most people that were in that journey kind of felt like, okay, if we cannot do this, then why are we doing it? So a lot of people stopped. Yeah, and um, it also gave me a pause to like, okay, should I just continue or should I keep going? So, but because I've set that goal already that um, I'm going to do it. And I, I like setting goals, not because I can attain all of them. You know, I, I came to this country with a degree in finance and I tried getting a job. Or try getting, yeah. And every time people tell me we cannot just your know, result, we cannot check this, we cannot check that. Your result is from a foreign country. Um, A, B, C, D, and E. I said, okay, if the only way to get a job in the US is to get a degree, okay, I should get one. So I went back to the community college and I started then and I set a goal that. I should be able to get a master's before I turn 50. And I did it. Not because it was easy, but because I set the goal. And so that was the goal I set here that I'm going to try, even though the odds are against being the CTC, I've set my goal. It doesn't matter what they are saying. It doesn't matter what 
anybody is saying right now that you can't do A, B, C, D with it, I can still get what I'm going to get and get the satisfaction out of it. And so I decided that, okay, theoretically, I can do this and start with it. And that was how I found myself and saying, okay, I have to do it. But doing it, I also have to have the support of everybody around me, Scrum Alliance, Agile Alliance, Meetup, and this wonderful community that we have here. Many of you know what we all saw during COVID. I think COVID was very terrible. It was also a blessing in some in disguise because without COVID, some of we won't be doing what we're doing here today. Even though we we're doing a little bit of it, but we didn't pivot to the extent of doing this. So I was bored to my ebb when I was in Phoenix, and that was how I found um, South Florida Agile Association. And not just because of what I'm gaining here or what I'm giving out, um, volunteering and all that, but I think I have grown in certain ways that I never expected being in this community because this community gives a lot and takes a very little. It just takes your time, but it gives you so much. And so it's not just about coming here every Saturday, but it's some of those discussions that you don't even think should come out from here and they come out. And people are genuine giving those things. They are not asking you to pay them money. They are genuinely giving it to you. And so, and that was what those partners did for me. Partners like SAA, partners like Agile Alliance, partners like Scrum Alliance. So with them by my side, that goal was easy. Wasn't easy as easy, but it made the goal attainable. And so I wouldn't be talking about this today if some of this partnership wasn't here. I mean, I cannot tell you how I feel when I first met this group in Florida two years ago, right? Yeah, I think two years ago, yeah, when I met them in Miami. And because we've all been together for a while, I never know them, I never seen them before, and we met that day, and it felt like you met your family members that you've gone and lost for a while, you know? And so, and that's what this community is, and that's what I employ anybody who wants to go this route, because you have to find yourself a community. You know, I listened to a talk about 12 years ago from this S football player, American football from Nebraska, and he asked this question. He said, who knows who is the second most paid player on the field apart from the quarterback? And he said, it's the left tackle. And people said, why? I didn't know all this. He said, because the left tackle is, sees the blind side of the quarterback. And so I ask you, who is your left tackle? You have to find you a left tackle because you have to find that person or that group, you know, that sees your blind side because they will help you in so many ways. So with those partners, it was easy. Sorry, this thing is not moving. Go back. So it was easy for me to say, okay, I'm going to start this, get this goal, get this certification, and just start coaching, start doing good. So, and we all know that the CTC oh, is a gives you a real world experience. You know, it, it, it gives you, makes you work more because they ask you so many questions about yourself that you don't even know exist. It asks you about how you deal with conflict. It asks you about what you've done in the community. It asks you so many questions that you don't even, you think like, okay, why are they asking me this? So when I 
wanted to start this journey or when this journey began, before this journey, I did the OX. I don't know if anybody knows the organization. Um, it's called Organization and Relationship System Coaching. I did just one part of it. And I thought I've known coaching. So OX has so many tools that you could use, so many tools, but there are about two or three that are really, really, that I really, really like. There's DTA, which is like Designing Team Alliance. There's the third entity, which is really good. And then there's Constellations. But I think the one I like most is called Landworks. So, and the notion of a Landwork is three. It's just three items that you, you have to look at. It's that notion of a well-behaved tourist, a generous landowner, and then the simplicity of visiting one's each other's land. So Landworks gives you the ability to look at your own land, look at my own land, and be mindful of the landmines that are there. At the same time, also being careful of the delicate flowers that you could step on. And then there is this our uh, land that we both co-create, which is more like the promised land where we all be together and jive in unity. And so when I got this tool, I felt I've known coaching, I know it. So there was this team members that were having this problem at my one of my locations. So I went there trying to use this landmine. But what I did not take note was the landmines in their boat land. And instead of helping them, I exploded the landmines. And so I wouldn't have been able, I would have, I wouldn't have been able to explode their landmines if I had finished my CTC and understood what it means, which what coach, the bearded one, always talk about which is everybody has a manual. And when you meet a team or when you meet a group of people, you want to ask about their manual and you also tell them about the, your own manual and you ask those questions, how can we work together? How can we both coexist in this land? And when you ask those questions, how can we work together? you would be aware of their landmines and they will be aware of yours. And then you both can co-create this promised land that you're all looking for. And so those real world experiences and roadblocks were those things that I thought I actually knew before getting to this spot. But until I started filling this application and started getting these questions asked, you know, and being sent back to me to say, explain more. Let us understand how you will deal with this situation. Let us get more about what you're thinking. Let's get your innermost thinking about thoughts about this. And so the CTC actually offered me that ability to recognize those landmines that people have or teams have or my subordinates have that I just waved around like he's just been a big bully or he's just been snob or he's just been ABCD just without actually asking them, how can we work together? So those are those interactions that the CTC helped me in opening and making it more, me more aware of what it actually means to be a coach, not just say, what is your Problem. How can I help you today? What is it? What does success look like? And all that questions that we ask. But at the end of the day, just being tight, being able to understand where that person is coming from. So comes to the part. If you want to be a CTC, what is the part? So like I asked earlier, how many of people are aware of Scrum? Alliance or scrum.org. If you want to be a CTC, then you must be on the path of going through Scrum Alliance. And so you have to have your CSM, 
um, then your ACSM, then your CSPM before you get to the CTC. And if you really want to be like the bearded one, you end up with this shiny looking one here, the CST. And so it's that journey. And it's a journey that anyone among us here can take. But it starts with you recognizing who you are. It also starts with you wanting more, not just wanting more, wanting to create a difference and making a difference around your team, around your home, around the people you meet in the bus, around the people you meet in the park, just being a human being. And that's it. I hope I didn't bore you too much. Questions? <laughs> All right. So let's uh, give uh, Godwin a round of applause. Yay. Or use your emojis. <laughs> Yay. All right. So if you have any questions, this is your time. Hey, hey Godwin. What was yes. the toughest part of getting your CTC? If you were to name one error that you thought was like the toughest part of, of... I think it's that part question of actually knowing how you applied what you think you know to a real situation. Being able to apply it, not just able to describe what it is, but being able to apply those things that you thought you already know that are so simple, just being able to apply it and able to differentiate between coaching, mentoring, and consulting. Awesome. Yeah, yeah Patrick. Yeah, thank you for going over your journey. It was quite incredible. I'm glad, glad and really truly enjoyed it. So I'm, I'm interested in your experience with the pre-application call with one of the folks on the list. So because I already had an ICF, so, mm -hmm. so it was funny. I, I had my pre-application call with um, Sherry Silas, which was yep. So we went through, she was asking me all this, and then she it came to a point, she now said, okay. Um, she now started looking at my resume and she now saw, oh, you have an ICF or you already have um, an ICF credential. So we stopped, that was where the pre-call ended. Great, so, thank you. Yeah, because I already have, um, I had already, so with ICF, mm -hmm. you've already gone through um, um, how do I put it? I don't, there's a word they use for it. I don't know if it's a nice coach. supervised coaching. Go ahead, coach. That was going to say some pre qualifications, pre qualification or supervised coaching. And so, because I had already done that <laughs> supervised coaching and submitted it for evaluation, she said, I, um, There's no need for me to do the pre call for her to do. Um, the pre-coaching in the pre-call. So she just um, signed it off. Sure, he's pretty awesome. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Godwin. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Dwayne. Hey, Godwin. Thank you so yes, much sir. for sharing this. Thank you so much for sharing this excellent talk. So one thing I was going to ask you in regards to the CTC portion of your journey, you know, if you could look back, uh, could you list maybe one or two things you would have done differently or if anything at all? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I think I would have paid more attention to me and how I'm being a roadblock. I, I would have paid more attention to that because sometimes we think we've got it all. And they ask you this question, they look so simple, and you keep just answering the same question the same way. And they come back to you to say, we need more. Um, I'm trying to find while we're talking, if I can find one of those questions that you you actually think you're answering them, but they're actually asking you something different altogether. So I think it's me being a roadblock and also me understanding, like I said earlier, the difference between what a coach does and what a mentor does, different when you're consulting and how you've been able to use those things you've learned 
and also the ability to understand the different frameworks that you work with and also how they apply to what you're doing now. Those are those little, little stuff that I thought I knew before starting the journey and I found out that I will suck at them. Can I answer your question, Dwayne? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Trying to see if I can find that. If anybody can, if I can pull the pre-application, um, there's something I'm looking for there. I thought I had it here on this slide. Um, I can, uh, I put it in one of the notes. Yes, can you? Yeah. So, yeah. so Godwin, what's your yes, next sir. journey? What's your next journey? What, what's, what's after here? Yeah, so after here, I've, I've kind of seen the trajectory of how this thing is going. And so I, as much as it sucks to just be a CTC while you have your eye gazed on the CST. So, um, and that's the only reason why I'm friends with the bearded one, so that I can be a CST like him. Oh, it's the only reason, huh? <laughs> Uh, we, uh, it's the only reason. Okay, I see how it is. I see how it is. I see. But actually, it yeah, it's um the the next part. It's for me to at least um get my PCC and then see what's the next part. So the PCC is what's next for me. So before thinking about the CEC, because I don't want to put too many rods in the fire at the same time. Hey Godwin, we have a question for you in the chat. Um, what is the most important things IELTS coach should know and have skills to be developed in your opinion? Um, one, their blind side, and also that they can't help everybody. It's and um, also take yourself away from the problem. And so most of the time we start coaching the people, taking yourself away from the problem and help people understand the problem. Because sometimes we could stuff that we already know or experiences that we've gone through. And because of that, we infuse ourselves into that coaching. And then we try to solve the problem immediately because, oh, I have gone through that before. So it's getting yourself away and helping the person understand where the problem lies and asking those questions that could open up or make them see the way. But I think for me, it's get, get out of the way. Hey, hey Godwin, I, I wanna add a comment to your, your initial start of your presentation where you, you thanked the coaches that helped you out. Yes, sir. I want you to understand that we're very thankful of you, okay? You've made our life better. You've also let us learn as well. Okay, understand that, that it's bi-directional here. Like you've really, and meeting you in person and going to one of the gatherings that you had over there that, that we went to, that was really special for us. Okay, so so we thank you and you are family, okay? So again, thank you, Godwin, for the work that you've done, the people that you've touched. And um, very, very um, pleased to have met you and to, to be your friend. Thanks, sir. Thank you. I want you to know, Godwin, I've been practicing not crying. <laughs> okay. Um, because everything that Rick said goes double here. Okay. I'm sure Regina feels exactly the same way. You've been with us the entire time, tirelessly. Okay. So um, again, I, I could not be happier when I, when I heard the news. That was just fantastic. And then there was the, the, the sudden realization, took you long enough. <laughs> Sorry, but I got to push you. Yes, sir. Sorry, but I, I got to push you. Yes, sir. So yes, there you go. And, and I want to, I understand you're, you're, you're reaching your goals with these certifications, and, and I'm okay with that. But you were 
you were you were good before the certification. Yep. So your 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 heart is in the right place. So don't mm -hmm. ever think that that's that's the yes, it's great and it's an accolade and we want to celebrate, but you're so much more. So just keep that in mind as you're going forward. Thank you. I think when we spoke when we spoke yesterday, you know, I was so happy to see you. And he gives the best hugs, by the way. So I can tell <laughs> hey, hey, how, you listen, how that girl <laughs> in, in, in the airplane was like, I feel bad because somebody hugged me. <laughs> <laughs> and he's there, you know, with all his empathy. Uh, but one of the things I told you yesterday is like, you have that special talent with people, you know, and now hearing all your stories, like I'm not wrong, because you come across again, very humble, and very loving and very kind. And that goes a long way. And people don't forget that. So, you know, I always say, what's that trait that we're looking for when you're becoming an agile coach, but it's also in other roles as well, is, is the heartfelt ability to just want to help others you know that's really it like we we do it from our hearts and you're a great example of that so we appreciate you thank you godwin